In this lecture, we will be discussing the critically important pharmacokinetic concept called the effect site. The first thing I want to make clear is that this term is pronounced KE0 and not KEO. There you go, my rant is over. OK, let's define these terms. I define the KE0 as a surrogate for the rate constant for equilibration between the central compartment V1 and the effect site VE. And therefore the T half KE0 is the surrogate for the half-life for equilibration between the central compartment and the effect site. One way to think about the KE0 is as a lag constant. When we administer a bolus of propofol to a patient, the average plasma concentration rises very quickly and sometime after that, the effect site concentration will rise too. The KE0 describes the delay between those two events. You can also think of KE0 as representing those factors which affect the rate of drug transfer between the central compartment and the effect site, independent of the concentration gradient and independent of the nature of the membranes being crossed. This diagram demonstrates where the effect site fits in the three compartment model. You might be wondering why we speak of the KE0. Technically, it's the rate constant for elimination of the drug from the effect site into a black hole. Why not the K1E? Why not the KE1? Some questions don't have clear answers, but as best as I can tell, the reason is that the effect site is not a sign of volume. The KE0 is simply a lag constant, which doesn't describe drug flux, therefore it wouldn't be appropriate to call it a K1E or a KE1. One thing to keep in the back of your mind is that effect site does not always mean brain. For example, when we administer neuromuscular blocking drugs, these drugs exert their effects once present at the neuromuscular junction. Adenosine exerts its clinical effect when it arrives at the AV node. I'd like to take you through some clinical applications of the effect site concept to flesh out what rate constant and time constant really mean in this context. You may recall from the very first lecture that I recommended you read a document uh, written by Stephen Schaefer on the biophase, freely available online. Uh, this is in fact one of the doctors who gave evidence at the trial of Michael Jackson's doctor, uh, and he also happens to be a world expert on pharmacokinetics. Let's try to apply this concept. If propofol's T half KE0 is 2.6 minutes, and if time to completion of an exponential process is five half-lives, then that should mean that propofol's time to peak effect should be five by 2.6, which equals 13 minutes. Clearly that's not the case. The reason that's not the case is that the key word in this situation is equilibration. If we were to keep the plasma concentration of propofol perfectly constant at three micrograms per mil, then the time taken for equilibration between the plasma and the effect site would be about 13 minutes. But of course, that's not what happens during intravenous induction. The plasma concentration peaks very early, and then it falls. You might conclude, therefore, the T half K0 is an unimportant parameter. Well, the answer is, if the plasma concentration of a drug falls quickly, then the T half K E0 is a minor determinant of the time to peak effect. If the plasma concentration falls slowly, then the T half K E0 is a major determinant of the time to peak effect. On the right hand side, here, pancuronium, we can see that the blue plasma concentration curve looks a little bit more like that straight line infusion that we saw in the previous slide. Propofol on the left hand side as we know, it distributes very quickly, and this is the major determinant of its short time to peak effect. As we know, all entities pass according to concentration gradients. If the plasma concentration is higher than that in the effect site, there will be net movement of drug from the plasma into the effect site. The converse is also true. The point at which the crossover occurs is the time to peak effect. Let's say we were to reduce propofol's T half KE0 from 2.8 minutes to one minute. What effect would this have on the time to peak effect? And what effect would this have on the magnitude of the peak effect for a given dose? 
The answer is in this graph on the left of screen. We can see that if we decrease the T half K in ORT, that is, we make the drug equilibrate more quickly, we can see that the peak effect occurs earlier, and therefore the effect site curve will intersect the plasma curve, the thick line, at a higher concentration. Therefore, the effect of reducing the T half K in ORT is to decrease the time to peak effect and also to increase the magnitude of peak effect for a given dose. On the right, we can see a comparison of three conventional opioids along the same lines. Here is a table comparing morphine and fentanyl in terms of some of their pharmacokinetic parameters. My question to you is, if they have such similar kinetics, then why is there such a difference in their time courses? Well, there might be several reasons. They certainly differ in terms of other kinetic parameters and potency. But one reason might be that they differ in terms of those factors which determine the T half K E naught, things like ionized fraction and lipid solubility. You can see here that the plasma concentration versus time curves are fairly similar. But the effect site concentration curves couldn't be more different. Fentanyl equilibrates during the distribution phase and then tails off. Morphine equilibrates more slowly and only once distribution is complete, therefore its concentration tails off more slowly as well. Next question is, how long does it take for an IV bolus of fentanyl to cause analgesia? Well, the answer is it depends. Here we can see that the time to peak effect is the same no matter the dose of the drug, at least in theory but the time taken to reach the therapeutic concentration is highly dependent upon the dose that is given as well as the rate of effect site equilibration. We see that the duration of therapeutic effect is also dependent upon bolus size. Here, with the small dose, the duration of therapeutic effect is small. With the larger dose, the therapeutic effect is substantially longer. Of course, this is something that we all intuit, but I think it's useful to appreciate these things in terms of pharmacokinetics. The last question I would like you to consider is this. Thiopentone and propofol both produce anesthesia primarily by their actions at the GABA receptor. Why is it that propofol should dim the lights slowly while thiopentone kills them instantly? This is what I think might be happening. Thiopentone has an effect site equilibration half-life of one minute compared with propofols 2.6 minutes. This means that there is much faster equilibration between the plasma and effect site for thiopentone than there is with propofol. This means that the transition between zero concentration and anesthetic concentration for thiopentone is fast, whereas the transition between zero and anesthetic concentration for propofol is comparatively slow. Lending weight to this theory is the observation that we have all made that the anesthetic endpoint is even harder to discern when administering propofol using a TCI pump. They achieve a much gentler and more stable induction, at least in theory, but one of the prices that we pay for that is that it isn't so easy to tell when it is time to give the relaxant or to insert the LMA. Note that this is a graph of my own creation. The numbers do not necessarily reflect reality. It's more to illustrate the point. I'll finish by listing the effect site equilibration half-lice for some of the commonly used drugs. In summary, the T half K in ORT is a bit like a lag constant for equilibration between the central compartment and the effect site. It is reflective of those drug properties which determine diffusibility. It can be used to explain many kinetic phenomena and it has many implications for drug administration.